On today's show, we're going to be exploring ProRes RAW, understanding what it is, and taking a look at some actual real-life footage. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here on YouTube at youtube.com slash photojoseph, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, talking about photo and video and all those kind of fun things. Hey, if you're watching live, that is awesome because I get to bring you up in the chat like this. You can ask questions live and we will do a Q&A after the main video, so uh, stick around for that. And of course, if you're not watching live, then just pop your questions into the comments and we'll do our best to get to them. So today's topic is ProRes RAW. ProRes RAW is newly announced at NAB 2018. So this is uh, this is the end of April 2018, so it was just a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago. That was last week, wasn't it? My goodness. And uh, it's kind of awesome. There's also a lot of confusion out there about it. And so I have done a bunch of digging and research and reading pretty much everything I could get my hands on and talking to everybody I could talk to about it. And I, I have a pretty good understanding of it. I'm not going to claim that I know everything there is to know about it because because <laughs> I don't think anybody does. Uh, but I am going to explain as much as I can. And the coolest part is I actually have some ProRes RAW footage shot on a Sony FS5, I think that's right, that uh, someone gave me. So I am going to show you how it works, what that looks like, so you can see what the actual workflow is. But first, let's talk a little bit about what this actually is. And I got my notes here, so I make sure I don't forget anything too important. So number one thing, and this is, I think, probably number one misconception out there. Raw does not mean uncompressed. Right? There's, there's a lot of idea like, oh, raw, if it's not uncompressed, then it's not really raw. Almost no cameras shoot truly uncompressed raw. Most cameras that shoot RAW are shooting some variation of compressed RAW. It might be a 3 to 1, 5 to 1 compression. And that is still better than non-RAW. But no, it's not as good as pure, totally unadulterated, uncompressed RAW. But almost nothing shoots that. You're talking way, way crazy expensive cameras. I think you even have to hook up like hard drive arrays. I'm not even sure how that works. But most cameras don't shoot uncompressed RAW. So when you see RAW and then you see something about compressed RAW, which is kind of a crappy term to use, but we'll, we'll use it. That's not, don't go, oh, well, it's not real raw. No, it is. It's still real raw. Different cameras deliver a different type of raw signal. Even to forget about video for a second, just talk about stills. What your Panasonic, your Canon, your Nikon is delivering as a raw file is there's a variation in that raw file um, depending on the manufacturer. So just keep that in mind. It's just an important point that I wanted to, to bring up in the beginning. Also, raw is not always advantageous, right? Raw is better, sure. But it's not always necessary. Just like shooting RAW on your still camera. I'm going to make a lot of correlations to still photography here. Just like shooting RAW on your still camera, if you have a perfectly balanced scene, if you have a very low dynamic range scene, if there's no real advantage to shooting RAW, then you don't need to. right? If you're not going to take advantage of it, then you don't need to. So going, oh my god, I can't shoot this in RAW, well, it, it probably don't worry about it. I mean, you've been getting along so far. Uh, just fine so far. And yeah, some scenes would definitely benefit from RAW. It really comes in handy in, ex in higher dynamic range scenes or overexposed shots. And we're going to see some of that in here, how you can recover, just like crazy recovery. But, um, but it's not always to your advantage. Again, just like shooting RAW versus JPEG on your camera. With that said, one of the major advantages of the ProRes RAW workflow is the workflow itself. If you look at RAW raw shooting from other manufacturers it is well from well yeah the native raw shooting from other manufacturers like a red or canon or whoever else does raw sony i suppose there's a real process of developing the raw before you can edit it there's extra plugins and extra steps prores raw was designed from the beginning and it is and you're going to see this to be just as easy as shooting straight prores it really is virtually no different except that you have even more dynamic range more control that's, that's the big benefit of ProRes RAW over other types of RAW. Your, the file size is virtually identical or even in some cases smaller than standard ProRes. It's still quite a bit bigger than if you're just shooting internally, right? It's way bigger than your internal M MOV files or MV4, M4, v whatever you're shooting internally. It's way bigger than that, but it's about the same size or even smaller than standard ProRes, which in itself is kind of remarkable. And what you can do even on a laptop in RAW is kind of, kind of crazy. Okay, so there's some of the kind of overall benefits or non-benefits. Uh, current camera supported, just important, I'm gonna rattle off this list. You can find these listed anywhere on the internet, but there's not a whole lot of cameras supported yet. When this was announced last week at NAB, at the same time as Apple made the announcement, Atomos made the announcement for their support for it because they're the ones who are capturing it. 
and a bunch of camera manufacturers release firmware updates. It's quite a coordinated affair, honestly, um, right around the same time to give you that uh, to give you that raw capability. So right now you've got the Canon C300 Mark II, the Canon C500, Sony FS700, Sony FS5 and FS52, the FF7 and FS72, the Panasonic Vericam LT, the Panasonic EVA1, and coming soon, the DJI Inspire 2X7 is going to get it. So that's obviously going to be internal, which I think that'll be the first internal as opposed to recording to an Atomos uh, product. It's kind of cool. So that's all that shoots RAW, ProRes RAW right now. So all of those cameras, with exception of the DJI uh, drone, are outputting their raw signal over SDI. And that's an important distinction. It's not going out over HDMI. But then that begs the question, well, can it go out over HDMI? And unfortunately, there's no good answer for this yet. This is something that the camera manufacturers really need to figure out and let us know. We don't know if it's technically possible to update your Canon you know, 5D Mark whatever, your GH5, your Sony A7 III, whatever the latest. We don't know yet whether those can technically be updated to output ProRes RAW, output RAW, not ProRes RAW, output RAW, which the capture device, the, um, the Atomos Ninja, uh, um, uh, whatever it's called, the, the Atomos capture device will, uh, will capture for you. So that's what does the conversion into RAW. Basically, it does magic secret math, and that's stuff that comes from Apple, to convert the signal to the ProRes RAW that is captured on the Atomos recorder. So that's, that's where that comes in. So can the camera output RAW? Unknown. So before people start, and call, by all means, call your camera manufacturers, say, hey, Panasonic, hey, Canon, hey, Nikon, hey, guys, we want RAW. By all means, do that. But if the answer comes back that it can't be done, understand that it may not actually be able to be done. We just, we just don't really know yet. Um, okay, last thing, talking about what the RAW package actually is, and then we're going to take a look at the software. So when you... When you're shooting, well, any digital picture, you've got your digital camera, the sensor has doesn't have pixels, it has photo size. We've talked about this before on the show when we talked about the uh, the high resolution mode that the G9 happens to, to do. Uh, same idea, photo sites, you have four photo sites that make up a pixel. A photo site is a red, a blue, and two green photo sites. Those four recorders make up a pixel. Those four recorders detect the color and say the color is going to be this value and that writes that to the pixel. That's what you get when you shoot to uh, shoot to JPEG or shoot to any other existing non-RAW video format. When you're shooting RAW, still or video, the RAW file contains that original Bayer pattern info, that original photo sites info, and then the software does the conversion later. So in some regards, it's actually easier on the camera uh, which is why it's going to be really interesting to find out if we can get raw output because the camera doesn't have to do that processing. It also doesn't do the denoising, doesn't do color corrections. It doesn't do a lot of stuff that is left up to be done in software later. So just like raw still photography, your raw file that comes out of the camera is probably going to look pretty rubbish until you start to work with it. You've got to massage it. You've got to pull that color out of it. But what you can do with it is far more than what you could do with a JPEG. So same idea there. Um, it's, it, it really is very similar. Pretty much every video format that we've been shooting to date uh, with that is not RAW is really like shooting JPEG. It's just a higher and higher quality, higher bit rate JPEG, uh, higher bit depth JPEG, because we can do you know, more than 8-bit, of course, in video. But, uh, but it's essentially the same difference. So getting to RAW video is potentially a huge advantage. Um, but as we said in the very beginning, not necessarily. You may not always need it. You may not always need to go shooting RAW. Okay. Uh, and then, okay, so with that raw file, that raw file that comes in is a very high dynamic range file. Most of us aren't producing content for HDR output yet. It's coming, right? That's what's on Netflix. If you're shooting for Netflix, you might be doing HDR content right now. But the vast majority of us are just outputting standard SDR, or standard dynamic range content. You also see it listed as Rec. 709. So there's Rec. 709, which is standard. There's Rec. 2020, which is HDR. And you might hear me use these terms interchangeably. This footage can be output to Rec. 709, absolutely. And you still get huge advantages of it. And that's the workflow that we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you taking raw footage into a wide color space, workspace in Final Cut, but then outputting Rec. 709 as if we're just going to YouTube or standard broadcast TV and so on. So, got all that? Good. So next we're gonna look at the software here, look at the actual files. Before we do that, I wanna bring this up real quick just to remind you of our value for value proposition here on the show. If you feel like you learned something of value from this show, if you take value from the show, I would certainly appreciate it if you could put a little value back. And the easy way to do that is to go to photojoseph.com slash support. There's Patreon if you want to do a monthly thing. There's PayPal if you just want to do a one-off. There's the affiliate store. And then, of course, you have the ability to hire me directly 
if you have a big project, um, a streaming setup, a video production thing you're setting up, and you'd like a bit of assistance or guidance, I am available for that as well. So with that said, thank you very much for your support. Love that. Um, ooh, you know what? I'm going to do one more thing before I forget because today's Wednesday. Today's the last day that I can tell you this uh, and get you a discount on it. There is a conference coming up called Out of Chicago. It's in June, June 22nd to 24th in Chicago, obviously. I'm going to be teaching at that conference. If you use the code PHOTOJOSEPH to register, and today, Wednesday, whatever this is, the 25th is the last day to use this code, you get $50 off. If you can't register today, you can still register later. You just don't get the $50 off. But uh, it's in June. Go to outofchicago.com. That's super awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that. Okay. Um, Let's get over to the computer real quick. I've got two websites that are linked in the notes down below that you definitely want to look at if you're into the, uh, interested in this sort of thing. Uh, the atomos.com slash ProResRaw site. This has a big explanation of what they are, uh, what their, their part of this whole puzzle is. Uh, built into the Atomos recorder, so the Shogun Inferno, the name I, for some reason, escaped me earlier, sorry. The Shogun Inferno and the Sumo 19, that's the really big one, are both set up to do this. They already have the updates available. They were released last week. And this just gives you some specs about it and what it's like to shoot with it. So very good web page to read. If you want the technical nitty gritty, on the right here we have the Final Cut Pro white paper. This is uh, the Apple Pro Res Raw white paper from Apple. This is super technical techie info. This, there's some of that debayer pattering info in here. Um, again, all of this is linked down below. So if you really want to get into the weeds on this, please go there, read all that stuff, expand your knowledge. All right, now let's take a look at the setup. So here we're in Final Cut. I've created, this is a brand new project. I haven't done a brand new library. I haven't done anything to this yet because I want to start from scratch. So if I, this is the first thing. If I open the library settings, if you don't know how to do this, you go to your library, select your library, click on modify, go to the library settings. When you first create it, it's created in standard color space. What we want to do is switch this over to wide gamut HDR. Now you don't have to do this to work with ProRes RAW, but this is where you're going to get the most advantage of it, even if you're outputting standard uh, SDR footage, Rec. 709 footage. So we want to switch our project, our library into a wide gamut color space. And incidentally, the entire library goes. You can't have a library that has one project that's wide gamut and one that isn't. The entire library has to go into wide gamut color space. Okay, so we set that to wide gamut HDR. And let's just import some media. There's my ProRes RAW stuff. I'm just going to select all of these, make sure they're left in place, add to event, and import. So this is completely just make it import. I haven't done anything to this yet. I haven't added anything to it straight in. And the reason that I did this is because I want to show you that there is metadata embedded in the ProRes RAW file that tells the software what camera it was shot on and tells the software which LUT to automatically apply. So this is pretty cool. You get your LUT automatically applied to the shot. You can change it. You can use a different LUT. You can turn the LUT off if you want to, but it's automatically applied on import, which is kind of nice. So if we look at this, Click, select one of these shots here and look at the info palette over here on the right. You'll see that there's a raw to log conversion. This is going from Sony S-Log because it was shown on the, shot on the Sony FS5, sorry. Uh, and there is a raw, uh, the camera LUT that is applied as well, the same LUT, the Sony S-Log LUT. So we've got our raw to log conversion and the camera LUTs applied. If I turn this off, then we are going to see what basically looks like a um, a, a V-Log file, a log file. And interestingly, if I turn off the raw conversion, it kind of goes back to where it started, which I don't, honestly don't fully understand. But this is giving us our raw image to log, so as if we want to edit, as if we shot it in log, and then we can then take that and apply a LUT to it. Now, what you're seeing here looks awful, and you're thinking, okay, why does that look awful? Well, there's two reasons this looks awful. Let me collapse all this here. Uh, that was a bad idea. One of the reasons it looks awful is because these are all overexposed by two stops, at least. Dramatically overexposed on purpose so that we can show what it can do. Also, the other reason it looks awful is because we are in a HDR color space on a standard definition, an SDR monitor. Even if I had an HDR monitor, you wouldn't be able to see it over YouTube because I'm not broadcasting an HDR. So you don't get to see the proper colors. I don't get to see the proper colors. I would have to have an external hardware device and then connected to an HDR monitor to see all that. And we're going to do a show on that later because I finally have figured out how to do that. Um, we'll do a show on that later. But right now we don't have the ability to see that. But I don't care because I'm going to output Rec. 709. So let's go back into the project here, or Rec. the Final Cut. I'm going to create a new project, so we'll just call this test. And 
I can change my settings at this point, um, or I can change them later. I'm going to go ahead and just say use automatic right now, just to make sure that all my clips get set up properly. Select everything and add them to the timeline. And now I'm going to go back into my project settings, modify that. And at this point, I actually don't need to change anything for what I'm doing. But if I was doing HDR output, I would have to change this to one of the Rec 2020 outputs. But I'm not. I'm going to go standard Rec 709, standard, uh, standard def color, standard dynamic range color space. And that's where we're going to leave it. So I didn't actually need to change anything. This is all incidentally 4K. It's DCI 4K um, at 50p. This came out of the UK. So I hit OK, and again, we are seeing footage that looks awful. These were actually shot properly exposed, um, but everything else here is shot dramatically overexposed. So let's start with, I'm going to start with this bird shot here. And let me collapse this out, make a little more space. Oop, hide this. And I am now going to go to my color wheels. Um, look over here at the, at the RGB parade. You can see there's 100, there's our max, and there's zero, there's black. Massively overexposed. I'm going to grab the master exposure adjustment and just start dragging that down. Drag it down, and drag it down, and drag it down, and drag it down. Look at how much detail is in here. Let me take this up to 100%. Zoom into the bird. Uh, there we go. That data is all there. So there's where we started. Pulling it down, pulling it down, pulling it down. All of that data is actually in there. That's kind of crazy. But that is, that's a massive shift from a massively overexposed file down to a proper exposure. So that's one shot. We're going to look at a couple more. But before I do, I want to go back to the shot that was actually shot correctly exposed and show you a problem we have with this. So this shot here, let me go back to fitting this in the viewfinder or in the, in the uh, viewer. This is essentially properly exposed. Uh, if we look at our, our range in here, look at the uh, RGB parade, it's you know, okay, some shadow clipping, a little highlight clipping, but for the most part, it's properly exposed. Um, but look closely at this. There is a lot of noise showing up in here. Why is there so much noise showing up in here? Well, there's two reasons we're seeing all this noise in here. Remember, because it's shot raw, the camera hasn't applied any of its denoising. Every camera is applying denoising before it writes the, camera, the image to, uh, to the disk. That hasn't happened here. So we have to do our denoising in software. Plus, since we exposed it properly, it is essentially exposing for the shadows because it's such a dark scene. And as anybody who shoots raw knows, we should generally shoot exposed to the right. We should generally shoot a little bit overexposed. Probably not two stops, though, for stills. But for this particular camera, the person who shot this determined that two stops over was about the right place to go, which is why we look at these shots, these other shots that are so overexposed, but pull them back down. And once they get back down, they look fantastic. So that is going to depend on the camera that you're shooting with, but this is one of those things to keep in mind. It's really, really quite interesting about it. Okay, so now let's go to another shot. This is the shot that I think is just the most impressive. So we've got, I would say, almost a correct exposure underneath here. So we're looking out at this cathedral, which is completely blown out. It is in full sun. The camera is underneath this covered area in the shade. This is pretty well exposed here. Um, could actually be under, it could be a little bit darker, and this is massively overexposed there. So now let's see what happens. I'm going to take the master exposure. I'm going to start with that, and I pull this down. And you can see, look at the blue. Look at how the blue is completely clipped out on here. It looks awful. We can see the clipping that's happening here. All right, let's just keep pulling this down. And I'm watching the RGB parade. I'm going to keep pulling this down, keep pulling it down until my RGBs are at least mostly within range. My parades are mostly within range. Okay, so now. This is pretty properly, it might be a little, might have gone a little bit too far, might be a little bit dark, but it looks pretty good, right? The sky looks good and rich. Let's bring it up just a tiny, tiny bit. Incidentally, let me point this out to you if you hadn't noticed this yet. These sliders don't seem to go that far, but you can keep on dragging them. It's a weird Final Cut thing. I kind of wish there was a number on here, but watch that. If I go, let me zoom out of here a little bit. I'm going to take this down to the bottom and stop. That's as far as it goes. But if I keep on dragging, it keeps getting darker and darker and darker. It keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. We can get to this info if we look at the master sliders in here. Now we can see a, a number that actually goes farther. So if I, let me make sure I can fill this on screen. Let me zoom out just a little bit here. All right, watch this number down here. It's brightness minus 0.47. Let's just reset this. Uh, let's just do a full reset on this parameter. There we go. So brightness is at zero. If I take this down, to the bottom of the slider, it's only at minus 0.24. But as I keep going, as I keep going, you see that slider actually changing on there. And I can take this slider. How far does the slider go? The slider goes, the slider goes, hello. The slider doesn't want to slide. 
there it goes. The slider goes all the way down to minus one, um, which obviously is a little bit dark for this scene. Anyway, so you can you don't have to go into the numbers in here. I just wanted to show you because that's an easy thing to miss because there's no UI for it. But once you get to the bottom of here, you can keep on dragging. Okay, let's go back to seeing the whole thing. Uh, let's bring it back up a little bit. So there, that's bright. That is looking pretty good. Let me go back to fit. Now, clearly my shadows here are completely gone. All right, well, let's take our shadows and let's lift those up. And let's lift them up and lift them up and lift them up and look at all that data coming back in. I went a little bit high again by doing that. So let's pull my highlights down a little bit. And looking at the RGB parade, I am almost completely in range. A little bit of clip, ah, crap, I mean to do that. A little bit of clipping on the shadows. Um, but you know, it's always okay, I think, to clip a little bit, add a little bit of extra contrast in there. Maybe I wanna add a little bit of saturation back in. And now look at that shot. We have totally pulled that range in. And I, maybe I need to add some mid contrast and there would make it look a little better. But that is, that is kind of insane. Now that I've done this, let me back out of the full screen on here. I am currently viewing this at better performance. Let me go to better quality. So better, if you're not familiar with Final Cut, incidentally, you have two ways when you're playing back to view, better performance or better quality. Better quality is going to show you every pixel full resolution when you hit play. If your computer can't handle what you're playing back, let's say you've got, uh, I don't know, you've, you've got too many streams of whatever video format you're using, playing back at once, the system simply can't handle it, it starts to drop frames and stutter. So you can change it to better performance. At better performance, it lowers the resolution while playing. Um, probably does some other stuff behind the scenes, I don't really know. But it basically lowers the resolution while playing. When you stop it, it immediately draws it at full resolution, but allows you to play a lot more back at once, many more streams of video at once in real time. And usually when you're editing, it's more important to see it in real time than it is to see it at full quality. Of course, if you can get both, then bonus. So this is ProRes RAW 4K, and if I hit play on here at full quality, it is playing almost perfectly. You see a little bit of stuttering happening in there. Well, this laptop, my friends, is nothing new. This is a mid-2014 Retina laptop. This is an almost four-year-old laptop. Yeah, it's a 2.8 gigahertz i7. They're way faster than that. It's only got 16 megs of RAM. The graphics cards, uh, what is this, seven, fifty, two gig graphics card. So this is not, by any stretch, any kicking machine that you can get today. You can get much more powerful machines today, but it still can play this raw file pretty well with a single stream. But watch this. Let me just do this too. I'm going to go back in here, and let me do let me do two streams. Let's just drop this onto here. Um, you know what I'm going to do as well is just do a quick color correct on, on this shot here because that's just hideous to look at. So let's just take the exposure way, way down on there. Way down. I don't know why we're seeing weird stuff in there. No idea. This might be shot through some glass or something. Doesn't matter. Let's just get that down. Looking pretty good. Good enough. We'll just call it good enough. And let me take this video and let's take this and go to 50% on here, the size. I'm just going to take my scale down to 50 on there. And let's take this one underneath. We'll set it scale to 50 as well. And let's move these out of the way. So there's kind of two of them on here. And there we go. And with, let's drop it down to better performance. On my old laptop here, it is playing perfectly, not dropping any frames. I haven't, actually haven't gone to see just how many streams I can add on this laptop. But if you look at the white paper from Apple, they actually talk about certain CPUs, how many streams of, at full quality they can play. And it's insane. It's really, really impressive. So that's that. So playback quality, uh, performance, even on an old laptop here. My 5K iMac does a little bit better in this one, uh, which is I can play I can play a, a single stream at full quality. If I go to, I think at two, I had to drop it. Uh, anyway, it's performing very, very well. Performance is very good. Um, and I think that's it. That is everything that I wanted to show you on there. So yeah, you see, you see what we're getting out of the raw file. We see that you can see that we're pulling in an amazing amount of detail out of those highlights and pulling them down. It's just, it's remarkable. It's incredible what we can do. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is the beginning of a new era of video capture. Um, like when we started to be able to shoot raw on our digital cameras to be and reasonably process them, not require some crazy other thing to be able to process it. Uh, remember, you know, launch of Aperture, launch of Lightroom, the ability to just take a raw file, throw it into your software and treat it like it was anything else. That's what we're seeing here today. The ability to take a raw video file and just throw it into the timeline and edit it as if it was normal footage. No, we don't have that many cameras that support it yet, but of course that's going to change. Can existing cameras be updated? We don't know yet. We'll find out over the coming months, I'm sure, as camera manufacturers start to make announcements of whether they will or won't be updating. I have no idea. I have no inside information. Oh, the only information I've been told is we don't know. So 
we'll have to see what happens. So that's that. From here, we're going to go into the Q&A section of the show. So we're going to drop out of the main show and drop into the Q&A. So if you're watching live, stick around for that. And if you're not watching live, then just click on the link that's about to pop up on your screen. See you in a minute.